Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. As most of you know, the Malachucks are away on vacation. They asked me to kind of lead tonight. So here I am. Um, we're going to start with a hymn. Cal's going to come and lead us in the solid rock. Let's stand as we sing Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the Son. I'm on now? All right. Yeah. Better? Okay. So we're in Job chapter 9, and I'm going to start reading at 32, verse 32 and 35. And so this passage struck me when I've been, I've been reading through the Bible um, chronologically. I've been in church since I was, I don't know, seven or eight. And, you know, I, I'm sure I've read the entire Bible but all in bits and pieces. So I'd have a, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd read in, in the Gospels and then maybe the Garden of Eden and a story here or a commandment there or maybe some Proverbs or praise. And it, it you know, kind of got all the gist, but, but it's been disjointed. So I decided recently to read it as his story, right? Isn't that what history is? His story, God's story, as one narrative and everything in perspective of that narrative. And it's I encourage you all to do it if you haven't done it. It's a very enlightening way to read the Bible. But anyways, when I was, when I was doing that, I was reading in chapter 9 of Job, and this passage really struck me a while back. And then when Pastor asked me to give some thoughts tonight, I thought it fit well with the series we've been doing about a praying life. So, um, yeah, Job 9, 32. The Bible says... This is Job speaking, and he says, For he, meaning God, for he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us, 
that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the time, the freedom, and the ability to come here and look into your word a little bit. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that it would give us understanding, that you would help us to get out of this what you have intended for us. Pray that you would be with me tonight, help my words to be clear and understandable, and that anything that comes from me, certainly I hope comes from you through me. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, a little background to those verses of Job. Um, I think we're all, most of us are familiar with the story of Job. He was a godly man, a rich man, very well blessed, and the devil, the devil spoke to God and said, well, Job is, only serves you because he has everything. He's got wealth and a big family. Let me try him. And, and he'll condemn you. And so God allowed Satan to do that. And uh, in the blink of an eye, Job's wealth was, was gone, evaporated. His children, he lost all his children. And then even eventually his own health. And um, yet Job, Job was still wouldn't condemn God. And during this time, he had certain men, often called his comforters, come and give him advice upon his situation. So the background of what I just read, in the previous chapter, in chapter 8, one of his friends, so to speak, named Bildad, had spoken to Job and told him, it must be because of some sin in your life that God isn't answering your prayers. You're afflicted because you're not upright before God. And that Bildad told Job, if you make yourself upright and pure, and then you go to God, he'll answer your prayers and restore your prosperity. So turn back a page and look at Job 8, uh, 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 8. And this is uh, Bildad speaking, speaking to Job. He says, If thou wouldest, see, wouldest seek unto God betimes, and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee, and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. So I, I, I think that word be times where he says, if thou wouldest seek unto God be times, it means like now, urgently. Seek him urgently. And um, if you're pure and upright, he'll answer your prayers. After those verses, Bildad goes on with some very poetic uh, dissertation about look back in the former age, look at the old people in, in times past. All the hypocrites, the hypocrites are punished. God will not prosper the hypocrites. And, and then he, he goes through that through the entire, the entire uh, group of verses there. Then we get down to verse 20, again in chapter 8, um, and Bildad is summing up. And in verse 20 he says, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers. So that's kind of his summary. And in chapter 9, in the beginning, uh, Job answers. And basically he says, yeah, true, but, but how should a man be just with God? In, in uh, Job 9, 2, how should a man be just with God? Then Job goes through, again, some really amazing text. I just had fun reading this. It's, uh, it's very poetic and, and it flows very nicely. And, uh, and down in, he gets down to into verse 14, Job says, How shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? How shall I answer God? And Job's saying, I can't stand before God. I'm just a man. He's so far above me that even if I could approach him, whatever I would say would only prove that I am but clay and he's the potter. And then again in... Uh, down in verse 20, he points out if he claims to be just or that he says he is faultless, those very, uh, those very words prove him to have fault. In verse 20, he says, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. 
If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. So, just a, a question. Who, does, that brought to mind a New Testament passage for me. I think pastor quotes it often. Does anyone, does that bring to mind a particular passage in the New Testament where Job says, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. No. Well, to me, I thought of, I didn't know the, I didn't know the uh, reference, but it is 1 John 1.8, where, where it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And, you know, so if we say we don't sin, the truth's not in us, we're lying and we're sinning. And that's what Job is saying. If I go before God and I say, I'm just, I, you know, I don't have any sin, well, then that in itself is, is basically a lie and, and sin. And so there also seems in this passage here in, uh, in I'm on the wrong page, nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 20, and then also 21, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were pr- perfect, yet would I not know my own soul. And so I, there's a sense that even if he could, even if Job could say that he was guiltless, even if his conscience was totally clear, if he had. Uh, cleaned up his act, so to speak, and, and his outward um, actions weren't sinful. He had a clean conscience. He would still know that he has a, has a sinful nature. It seems that to me that Job knows what Christ is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, a well, little reference to our Sunday morning studies. In Matthew 5, uh, and I, why don't we turn there, Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22, and then I'll skip to uh, 27 and 28. Matthew 5, 21. The Bible says, Christ speaking, says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And then down in uh, verse 27, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so, you know, I, one of the m- many aspects of, of Christ's sermon there, to me, it, it just shows that the actions are a fruit, almost, of the sin that's embedded within us. The, the action of killing your brother is obviously a sin, but it's, it's, that's really just the fruit of that anger or hatefulness within you. And, and to me... In that passage where Job was, was saying, how can I go before my God and, and tell him I have no sin? I think he gets that. He, he's, he's seeing that, that even though I clean up my act and I, and I don't, you know, I obey all the, the rules, there's still sin in my heart. So how can I approach God? So in response to Bildad's advice that if he were righteous or sinless before God, God would make him prosper. Job says, how can I go to God to claim my guiltlessness? First, he's so far above me that I can't even approach him. He's God and I'm but man. Second, even if I could approach him, how could I choose my words? If I claim to have no sin, that's sin in itself. And third, even if I commit no sins, I know that my very soul has a sinful nature. So Job goes around and around trying to find an audience with God, but there's roadblocks each, in each direction. And, and then we come back to the key verses back in Job, chapter 9. I'll just read 32 and 33 again, the key verses we read earlier on. 
Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. So that word daysman actually means mediator. And the whole verse has a sense of longing to it, not just a statement that there is no mediator, but it's a longing. As a matter of fact, the earliest Christians translated this verse from Hebrew into Greek as, oh, were there a mediator between us? So Job is just longing, longing, oh, were there a mediator between me and God? I wish there were a mediator. And immediately I think then, and, and it, kind of, it kind of gets me excited just thinking of it now and saying it to you guys is 1 Timothy 2.5, where it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and, man, and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Job, all those years before, longed for a mediator. He wanted to be able to approach God. We have a mediator. Job said in verse 32, for he is not a man as I am, as I am that I should answer him and that we should come together in judgment. But by taking on humanity and the body of Jesus Christ, God became man. And now we, now we can, as it says in Hebrews 4.16, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so in Hebrews 7.25, uh, it also it says uh, that, Christ, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So I, that's really the whole thrust of, of what I wanted to share tonight was just how encouraging it was to me that Job longed and longed for a mediator and that, that God, made, God became man just so that we could have the mediator. And that's why, at least in my mind, when I pray, I always at the end say, in Jesus' name. And those are no magic words or some holy incantation, but it's just a, a reminder unto me that the only reason I have any right to approach a God who is so much higher than me is because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And so through Jesus Christ, the mediator, he can lay his hand upon us both, upon me and upon God. That's what I have, a very short hopefully encouraging message that goes along with our prayer, um, our prayer time tonight. So I will, I will close in prayer, and we'll, after I close, we'll end the live stream, and we'll go over the prayer requests privately. I would encourage any who are watching online, that once the live stream ends, join us in the prayer time. You're not in the room with those that are here, but you're part of our church, and we have a mediator. We have an incredible, incredible privilege to go before God himself because of what Christ did. So let's take some time. We, we know we have plenty to pray for, right, in our country, in our church, for our health, for our civilization, and for salvation of, the, of, of souls. So, uh, yeah, I encourage you, whether you're with your family, two or three gathered, pray there, pray alone, but in spirit, you'll be with us. All right, let's pray. Dear God, I do thank you so much for your word. I thank you especially for the sacrifice that you made to become man, to bridge that gap, that gulf, the gaping gulf that was so far that you bridged it for us that we might come, and not just come, but come boldly before the throne of grace. We pray that as we uh, spend time together now, lifting our prayers, that your Holy Spirit would be among us, that our prayers would all be in your will, and that you would just fill your church and empower your church to change the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.